Okay, camera's running. Press you know. Yeah, keep, keep, an, keep an eye on this. If it, uh... The secret violation by Satoshi Nakamoto is about to proceed. I have not known nor have I ever been Satoshi Nakamoto. <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> Thanks. Um, okay, anyway, now no, that no, I was going to camera. Right, Ethereum for normal people, right? The problem that we have explaining Ethereum is that everybody starts with Bitcoin. And if you start with Bitcoin, explaining Ethereum is a completely impossible and fan cost task. Because it just doesn't make any sense, because Bitcoin itself is inherently extraordinarily complicated and annoying to explain. So, Ethereum for normal people. On the front end, you've got a thing called MIST, which is essentially a web browser. There is no magic to it, it's a web browser, but it connects to something which is not the, int the web, it's the Ethereum network. So instead of the web, you connect to a different network, but it's fundamentally a web browser with some added security. There's a set of client libraries or a command line interface which is managing all the necessary crypto to connect to that network. Um, the sum total of all the nodes running that software is essentially the network, which is basically a mesh database. Big, decentralized, and all the rest of this stuff. Now, this is the innovative part of the explanation. What the mesh database gives you is a series of timestamped blocks. So, Block number one, block number two, block number three, block number four, timestamped blocks. Each block contains a series of statements. Uh, the, um, the users of this kind of browser interface all have a pair of cryptographic keys, which are a key pair of average user. With those keys, they digitally sign a statement, put it into a transaction. The transactions are recorded in this chain of blocks, and that's all blockchain is. It's a series of digitally signed statements that are sequenced into batches, and um, those batches form a coherent history. Right? So it's essentially just a file that you can only write to the end of, and there's a bunch of magic. Now, here's the clever part of uh, the new explanation. All of the magic happens here. So the past is completely and indelibly fixed, and there's no controversy about the past once it's, say, an hour old, or in Ethereum's case, six minutes old. All of that stuff is completely fixed. However, from the present, uh, you know, from say the present back for half an hour, say, there's this kind of nebulous period where we're not exactly sure how history will be written up. So you have a present which is kind of a sliding window, and at the end of that sliding window, the present becomes the past, and the past is fixed. But this is kind of squishy, and yeah. um, all of the complexity is run here at what's essentially the head of a loom. If you're weaving. Right? You've got all of this warp in this web, and then you've got a process which weaves that together into the fabric of history. Once it's in the fabric, it's immutable. Now, here is the great insight that I am incredibly proud of. We don't have to care how that works, we just need to know that it does. So, most of the time when people are explaining Bitcoin or Ethereum or all coins or any of the rest of that stuff, they spend all of their time explaining just that print head and how it weaves together the present into the past. But actually, we don't care, right? If you were working with an um, SQL, right, to begin transaction, throw a bunch of stuff, commit, mm -hmm. right? And what happens between our transaction going into the database and the acknowledgement coming back with the commit? We don't actually care, right? Unless you're into database optimization theory, you just have no interest in that step. And every time we explain this stuff, all we ever do is that part. So. Yeah, you know the traditional lamp stack? Right, so Linux, uh, Apache, MySQL, and PHP, Python, Perl, etc. Right? Uh, and then on the front end of that, you've got the browser, which we'll call Mozilla. So there's your lamp stack. Right? If you're doing this stuff instead of doing the lamp, you're doing it Ethereum, Linux is Linux or Windows or Mac, right? We, we don't really care what you're running on because it's cross-platform. Instead of Apache, we've got the low-level CLI stuff, right? You know, there's a there's essentially a server architecture that's all nicely decentralized. Instead of MySQL, we've got the blockchain database. Right? 
instead of PHP, Perl, Python, etc., we've got Solidity uh, or LLL or any of the other languages that run in the Ethereum environment, and then instead of Mozilla, we've got this. So basically, when people say Ethereum, what they're talking about is that technology stack, and that technology stack is immediately recognizable to web developers. We just haven't been explaining it that way because Ethereum has been far too focused on explaining what Ethereum is to Bitcoin people rather than explaining what Ethereum is to web people. Right? You, you have the client, you run the client, through MIST, you upload content into the blockchain, other people access the content, the content can't be edited because it's been stuck in this permanent form. It's basically just a decentralized web stack with lots of added cryptography and finance and immutable scripting and smart contracts and a bunch of other stuff. But in terms of explaining the damn thing, that's how we ought to be doing. Right. Uh, shall I turn the camera off or does anybody want to ask a question on camera? Who about MIST? Um, so Ethereum crowdfunded 30,000 bitcoins, which at the time was worth about $18 million. MIST is, I seem to remember based on WebKit. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I might be wrong about that. But it's either WebKit or Gecko or one of these things. But it's you know it's based on standard browser technology, plus a whole bunch of additional stuff as well because you can go and just reference. Yeah, thanks, guys. So, in that sort of context, the other bit of this is you know IBM has forked Ethereum into a thing called a DEM. Mm -hmm. So their notion is that your Internet of Things devices, right? If you've got a system where you've got your kind of IoT device here and it has to connect to a server, um, eventually somebody will turn off that server because the device is now obsolete and then your toaster will stop working. So IBM's notion is that you have uh, the toaster connect to a blockchain that's being used for lots of other things at the same time, and at that point you don't have to worry because the blockchain is essentially permanent. It's as permanent as the stored value which is in it. So you wind up with IoT devices which are no longer slave to a central server which makes them vulnerable. I understand that part um, of adept. Yeah, it's 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 exciting and uh, you know fantastic. But yeah. what's the incentive for people to sit there and maintain a permanent blockchain for the benefit of a toaster? Yeah. You don't. The blockchain is being used for fifty-eight other thousand things. So, so you're putting a whole lot of stuff into the same blockchain. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, mm. this is scalability is an issue. Well, I mean, people keep worrying about scalability and fussing about scalability. Blockchains, well, hard drives are what, doubling in volume every year and a half? Mm -hmm. You can now buy a six terabyte hard drive which will fit in your PC. Laptop hard drives currently max out around two terabyte. Entire transaction history for Bitcoin is 21 gig maybe? It's yeah, just, yeah. you know? I, the, I'm not, the limits I'm, to the blockchain are in different places. There's space. Yeah. And there's the bandwidth across the net. You've got to send all these signals across the net to keep it going. Yeah, absolutely. It's now, even now, it's moved to a point where they're now talking about thousands of super nodes and everybody else is listening to the super nodes. So it's no longer the distributed nirvana that we were talking about. Right. So these guys are going to require an incentive at some point mm -hmm. if they end up powering the world's toasters. And frankly, Beyond toast. Well, okay, so nature of incentivization. The Ethereum yes. model is that people pay to store stuff in the blockchain. So if I store something into the blockchain, I have to keep paying to keep it there? No, because there's no way to get it back out again. But people make payments when it's being written in. And then what you have is a certain notion of a sliding window of stuff which is currently active and is easy to access. Yeah. And increasingly all the stuff is increasingly rare. Potentially. But I mean, fundamentally, there is no perfect answer to this. So you're saying that people will keep um, the full archive, a mm. few people will keep the full archive, and uh, most people will keep the current archive. Well, right. I, think okay. That, okay. I think that the full archive is going to turn out to be actually, in practice, inexpensive. Mm. Right? Even if the full archive is four terabytes, mm. right? which would be you know, an order of 200 or 2,000 rather more than the book, right? Yeah. at the end of the day, it's four freaking terabytes. Yeah, it cost we've, you we've already crossed that barrier. Cost yeah. you a hundred, cost you a hundred dollars to store. Yeah, yeah. So if the cost of storing the entire transactional history is hundred dollars, yeah. anything that's the it's size of a movie is probably, and that's a thousand movies. It's a thousand movies, right? So, so it's a big deal. 
I, I, I don't see that as being an issue. People are very, very worried about scalability. I mean, it becomes an issue, think of like Visa, right? So if you're doing OLTP, uh, online transaction processing, so the server can never come down because if it does, you can no longer pay for things. If you're doing OLTP, the volume is terabytes, right? Now, if you're rendering high-res movies, you know, you're, so you're, you're like DreamWorks or, um, oh, what did you guys make Shrek? And Pixar. Pixar, right? If you're DreamWorks or Pixar, you're handling quantities of data in a commercial context which are tens of thousands of times the size of any you imagine we're watching, right? Right. Um, it's just not that hard once you begin to think of like hundred million dollar movie budget, yeah. five million of that is on servers. Yeah. And um, you're shipping it over night from yeah. one continent to another, so different teams can work on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, it's not as if this level of scalability is mm -hmm. like NASA technology. It's at worst Pixar technology. And if you're talking about something which genuinely is powering, you know, has presence on twenty percent of the world's cell phones. I don't think paying for Pixar technology is going to turn out to be an outlandish prospect. Right, um, that'll do. Do you want to turn the camera up? Should I turn it on? You are not allowed to turn the camera up. Where is the button?